Welcome into We Are SC Game Day. USC, Stanford, tonight, it starts off the Pac-12 season. And this is really a game that has taken on that role of starting the Pac-12 season. USC, Stanford meeting early, early in the year. Uh, it, it seems like for a number of years in a row now. This is a rivalry that maybe gets overlooked in that UCLA and the Notre Dame. I mean, obviously you have those big ones, but this one goes way back and it means a lot. And for this team this year, it means a whole lot. Greg Katz, welcome on in. What, what is the Stanford USC rivalry in recent years, really? What, what have you seen from that? What does this game mean uh, for, for USC's season, really, as it gets kicked off? I think it's a measuring stick for the program. I think that uh, Stanford, since Jim Harbaugh took over and then David Shaw, they presented SC with, uh, you know, some real challenges. And SC has presented them with some real challenges. And, uh, you know, this has kind of been a tradition going all the way back to John McKay and John Ralston back in the late 60s. Um, I think it's a situation that's very unique because they're two private universities and there seems to be some sort of sibling rivalry over it. Um, I know one thing that it draws out the best in both teams, whether that's good or bad. Um, it's really a, a test, really, not only uh, uh, physically, but uh, mentally. Uh, you know, Sanford likes to think they're the intellectual bullies. They can back it up now physically. And of course, SC doesn't like that idea at all. But, uh, you know, in recent years, it's kind of been like kind of a seesaw battle. Daryl, what, what are things that have kind of popped out for you a little bit uh, over maybe the last four or five years? D do you get a sense where when USC goes into this early game with Stanford that you can kind of see what the season is going to shape up to be based on either the, the outcome of that game or performances during that game? Oh, absolutely. And this is one of those rival games that extends – far back to 1905 being the first time that USC played Stanford. And in more recent years, this game has been kind of like the pendulum game early in the season to really set the Pac-12 um, standings for USC. Granted, Stanford is in the North, but it's this bully mentality, which is why Stanford has kind of bullied this rivalry um, in the last 16 matches uh, against Stanford. USC is only four of 12. And that's not the side you want to be on for any type of rivalry. But when I think about this particular game, this early in the season, it always comes down to, for me, this is the gut check, the indicator that lets me know how physical of a team USC will be. Because when they go up into this game, it's body shots after body shots. And more than likely, each team comes out feeling um, battle tested for the, the season to come. But in more recent years, when USC has had success, it's because they've won the battle in the trenches. Those fourth, and, and what always comes to mind is those historical fourth down conversions. And in a game like this, you can always count on Clay Helton to, to, to have a gut check. On fourth and short, does he go for it? Does he respect the rivalry and try to run against that um, stout front seven of Stanford? If USC can have success like they've done in years past, the year that Sam Darnold led them to the Pac-12 championship and, and into the Rose Bowl, if they can have those um, short yardage victories, I think that this is a game that's really set up well for two, uh, for two teams featuring backup quarterbacks as their new starters. Yeah, USC, Stanford, the last six games, Stanford has four of them. They're 500 going back, eight games, USC four, Stanford four. Greg, last thing here, give, give me one thing that stands out to you about the USC-Stanford rivalry, and, and you can go back kind of a, as far as you want uh, <laughs> to pick again your, your one thing. Uh, well, if we're talking about a game, are we talking about a game here, or are we just talking about the rivalry in general? Uh, a game, the rivalry, anything. When you think USC-Stanford, what, what comes to mind for you? Well, for me, uh, when I was 19 years old, I was at the 1969 game. And uh, it was always a rivalry, but it was the peak of the rivalry. USC was number four in the country, and uh, they got down early 12 to nothing, and there was actually 82,000 people there. It was one of the larger crowds even during the McKay era, unless it was Notre Dame or UCLA, but it was Stanford. And Stanford had a young quarterback named Jim Plunkett, and uh, he was on fire. And the SC got back in the game uh, through an interception by Tyrone Hudson, a pick six. 
And uh, then they came back with a running back named Mike Berry, was one of the first tailbacks uh, that was out of state. He was from uh, Minnesota. And then the, they battled really hard. And I remember Stanford got up late in the game. And I, my first thought was, okay, there's the whole season going down the drain. Stanford's going to the Rose Bowl. And in my own pessimistic way, I said, that ain't going to happen. And so Stanford had scored and SC got the ball, you know, uh, deep in their own territory. And uh, they weren't going much places. But all of a sudden, Jimmy Jones, a sophomore quarterback uh, from Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, uh, caught fire. But there was a crucial fourth down uh, draw play. Fourth, I think it was five or fourth and seven. And uh, John McKay crossed up everybody. He gave the ball to uh, Clarence Davis, uh, who was replacing O.J. Simpson after Simpson had graduated. And it was, like, shocking to see Davis go uh, – between the tackles and get seven yards. And from there, uh, Jones passed to uh, uh, Jerry Moon Mullins, uh, who later played for the Pittsburgh Steelers as a guard, but he was a tight end at SC. He was out of Anaheim High School. And then they threw down the field next to Sam Dickerson, of the, you know, to make it really exciting. And then the clock is moving, uh, and SC lined up for a field goal uh, within about 30 yards, uh, give or take. And a young guy named Ron Ayala, who was a great quarterback safety at Lakewood High, came in. And it was like, this is like a storybook. I don't believe this type of stuff. And what I remember is that he kicks it as the clock, his ball's in the air and counts down to zero. And, of course, it was good. And one of the few times in that era that I saw people rush the field. And I remember running on the field myself like a, like a fool. And uh, I, one of the things I remember was looking at a linebacker that SC had named Greg Slough, who was a transfer from uh, San Diego City and who had been a Vietnam War veteran. And just looking at this guy, he looked like he was just nuts. And uh, some kid tried to grab his chin strap. And I remember he knocked the kid's hand away and said, get your hands off that chin strap, boy. And I said, oh, boy. Uh, and remember, the two, team, the two sides of the line of scrimmage for SC, the offensive side was known as as the cardiac kids defensive side at the wild bunch the, the original wild bunch was which was phenomenal so that's my memory all right daryl how about you U usc stanford something that comes to mind you know uh i keep going back to stanford's offensive coordinator pritcher when usc was ranked second in the country harbaugh comes into the coliseum of uh, vastly under um as an underdog i think they were like over 30 point underdog and they came in and they stole a game 23 24 and uh 24 23 rather and what stands out to me about that particular game is the confidence that USC had overlooking a Stanford team that just really kind of limped into that game and I just remember that you know the guys on the other side from um from Northern California how many of them were also recruited by USC and felt maybe slighted by USC. But in this game, they really put their big boy pants on and it was just a tough, hard fought game. But beyond that, I go back to um, my most historical memory of this USC Stanford rivalry. I was a sophomore in 2000, finally got a start. I was playing opposite of Chris Richard and I'll never forget. We were up, we were leading um, up uh, at the farm and I sprained my ankle. And for many uh, who followed my career, I'm from Long Beach Poly, and my quarterback was Chris Lewis. And here you have it, quarterback gets injured, Chris Lewis comes in with, and late in the, in the uh, fourth quarter, and I'm injured, I'm on the sideline, and I know the moxie and the character of a Chris Lewis. He comes in with ice in his veins, leads Stanford down inside the red zone, and I remember uh, Dennis Thurman was our defensive uh, secondary coach at the time. He pulled myself and Kevin Arbett aside. And, um, and I remember him saying, take, uh, take away Ronnie Pittman. He's going to go to the corner. And Kevin Arbett, bless his heart, love him to death. But he jumped inside, and sure enough, the ball was thrown in the corner. And till this day, whenever we meet up with Chris Lewis, he never lets that down. So it's one of those things where, you know, I was on the opposite end of the victory, but that was one of those games that I'll never forget simply because of the connections between the two teams. You know, for me, it's interesting you go with a loss, and, and I'm going to go with a loss too. That, that 2011 game with Andrew Luck, 
Uh, yeah. Going into triple overtime, the the one play, the Nikel Roby interception that he returns for a touchdown. Yeah. I, you know, I, Greg, you've obviously been in the Coliseum a lot more than I have, but I've been in the Coliseum for a lot of games. I have never, maybe never heard it as loud as when Nikel Roby steps in front of that pass and returns it for a touchdown. And you thought this, this was it, this was done. But uh, again, you end up that, you, you leave that game with a loss. But for me, that the, the memory of that game, the back and forth, I, I think 56 points ended up winning it. Uh, that, that game to me stands out in this rivalry. I, I will be shocked if we get up into the 56 point range uh, tonight in, in this game between these two right. teams. But for me, again, talking about Stanford USC, that's absolutely one of the things that, that stands out the most. So after this, we're going to get into breaking down some of this USC Stanford game, starting with the USC offense against the Stanford defense. Welcome back. Eric McKinney here with Greg Katz and, uh, Greg, so many questions about the USC offense, and it starts with the quarterback, Keaton Slovis. He, the true freshman taking over for the injured JT Daniels. Now, we got a little bit of a sense of him the second half of the Fresno State game, albeit that offensive game plan went run heavy. Clay Helton said this week, you're protecting a lead with a freshman quarterback. That's where you're going to go. He said the playbook is absolutely wide open for him. What do you expect specifically from Keaton Slovis on t tonight uh, based on what you've seen over the over spring ball and over fall camp? I think to begin with, I think we'll see poise. I think he'll, he'll, he'll hold his own in terms of the beginning of the game. I'm sure Stanford will do everything possible defensively to get to him and see if he uh, handles getting roughed up. Uh, and then uh, I happen to think that he will get back up. I think he's a tough kid. You know, I, I think he's got a lot of a uh, lot of character. I think he's got a lot of uh, uh, ability to uh, put the game ahead of his own well-being. Um, I think that the idea that the playbook is open, we'll see about that. I'm sure the playbook is open. It depends on what plays they call because we know from the first half to the second half of the game against Fresno State, they kind of went into the fetal position with Slovis. And surprisingly, we're effective running the ball uh, because they put their mind to it. What we don't know is what, what Graham Harrell is going to do. And what we really don't know is what uh, Clay Hilton is going to do. And this, when, like, example, uh, fourth down, victory formation, all those sort of things that drove people crazy, okay? Uh, that's not that's not, uh, you know, uh, Slovis's issue. He's going to do whatever he's asked to do. Uh, I think what we have to uh, look at is the fact that this is going to be a different defense for Slovis to look at. Stanford is, is strong in the secondary. They're physical up front. Uh, any remnants of, of – I mean, they basically held a very physical Northwestern team in check for the most part. Now – do I think that uh, Slovis is better than the Northwestern uh, quarterback? No, because I think the Northwestern quarterback, you know, was their first string quarterback. But I think as the game goes on, we'll see how Slovis reacts to it. What we don't know is in the third and fourth quarter, if it's tight and, you know, the pressure is really on, that's going to tell us what Keith Slovis is, is all about. It may be asking too much for a freshman, but let's remember he did play in spring ball. He did have a whole half against Fresno State. You know, I assume he'll be a little nervous to start the game, uh, and he'll have to adjust to uh, a different type of athlete and discipline by the Stanford defense. Yeah, I, I think, you know, with all the, the talk of the air raid and all that, when, when USC does well against Stanford, they, they bring that run game, and they can actually match up on the offensive line. And, and it does seem like in the past, that you know, these past five, six, seven, eight games, when USC plays Stanford, they can sort of turn that physicality up up front. Uh, they, they do seem to hit with Stanford at these games. There, there's something about kind of Stanford that, that brings it out of them. I think it's going to be fascinating to watch. Again, Clay Helton said, wide open playbook, going to call anything. I think it's going to be fascinating if that's true because you saw Graham Harrell in, in the second half. He took a couple deep shots, and Clay Helton specifically said that he loved – that he let Keaton Slovis take those deep shots. If they allow Stanford to, to crowd the line of scrimmage and they don't test him deep, 
uh, it, it could be a long day for some of those USC running backs to try to find room. And the other thing I'm watching is you had two really significant plays against Fresno State where Fresno State brought some extra guys where they the, the play that JT Daniels went down on, maybe some miscommunication up front, maybe some, some uh, you know, a, an opportunity for JT Daniels to get rid of that ball when he sees the extra heat. And then on that fourth down play where you let a guy come straight up the middle and almost take the handoff between quarterback and running back. So, again, you know, looking at the USC offensive line against Fresno State, a good performance considering kind of the issues that maybe you thought there could be coming into the season and, and against a pretty good Fresno State defensive front four. I don't think there were a ton of complaints with the offensive line. But if you see those kind of breakdowns against Stanford, Stanford has the kind of front seven, both with personnel and with scheme where they can really cause a lot of confusion. And for me, that is what I'm going to be watching, how Keaton Slovis sort of handles, you know, where pressure's coming from, if he can sense that, if he can pick that up, if he can get rid of the ball and not take hits. Because, again, Stanford can kind of do any, you know, with that 3-4, it makes them really versatile in what kind of pressures they can bring and, and where they come from and who they're coming from. And, and then, obviously, the, the uh, Adebo, the, the Stanford cornerback, you, you can't throw the ball to him. I mean, if you put the ball in the air a number of times his way, he's going to end up with his hands on the ball. And so those are kind of the things um, for me. For you, w what needs to click offensively for USC? Who, who are maybe some of the guys uh, that you can rely on and, and that need to have big games against the Stanford defense? Well, obviously the wide receivers have to have big games. They have to get a run to grass, as uh, Graham Harrell says. I think the offensive line has to have a big game. Uh, my thoughts on it is I'm not quite sure that the offensive line we saw last week is the same offensive line we're going to see this week. And I say based that on the scrimmages I saw at SC where Trojan defensive line seemed to uh, stuff the offensive line. And I happen to think that, you know, SC's got a very physical uh, defensive line it's at some level, but so does, so does Stanford. I think the key element to me, getting back to Slovis is, you know, don't underestimate his ability to run out of the pocket. You know, he can move, he can move. He's deliberate. You know, he take, he take fixes shots. And I think if he actually gets Stanford to have to respect that I'll run out of the pocket, uh, it could change things in, in a way that keeps Stanford off balance. Uh, but, um, you know, it's really going to get down to the trenches, Eric. Uh, it's going to get down to whether SC can move the ball on the ground and protect uh, Keith and Slovis. And that means I'm looking at the five guys of that offensive line. And if they can't do the job, it's not Slovis' fault. I mean, Jay, it wasn't JT Daniels' fault that he got racked up. I mean, you know, we can talk about, you know, all the offensive line did, but it was always my fear that when they got through the line of scrimmage, you know, that JT was a pinata. And they did get to him. Uh, you know, maybe it was just a, you know, bad quirk, faith call it what you want that he actually did get racked up to the point where he's lost for the season but uh you know we'll see what happens with the old line I think that's the number one area for me to to focus in on yeah and I think that's probably something that you could say about every game from here on out is watching that offensive line I, I'm also one of the things that got brought up this week is sort of the rotation among skill players running backs and wide receivers we saw you know the starters go for basically the entire game against Fresno State. Graham Harrell was asked about that. He said, you know, it's gotten to the point where they run so many plays so quickly in practice that the starters, if they can stay out there, they stay out there. He said they'll do a better job of getting guys in in terms of a rotation. Marquis Step is a guy that we did not see a running back against Fresno State. I think against Stanford, if you're looking to kind of move that pile, he could be a guy. But then you look at, you know, Vavai Malpe, he, he's fine up in there. And, and, you know, they've got guys, when you talk about maybe bringing true freshmen in a receiver, if you have Michael Pittman, Tyler Vons, Amon Ross St. Brown, and they feel good, they feel 100% and can go, I, I would have a hard time as a coach pulling those guys off the field. But I do think you're going to see more of a rotation. I, I think the number of plays that they ran in the first half against Fresno State, if they can do that against Stanford, I think it gets easier and easier. Uh, to, to put guys in but you saw in the second half it really kind of bogged down I think fewer than 30 plays uh, in the second half against Fresno State and if, if you're not running enough plays a you're not scoring and b you're not getting tired so that'll be something interesting to watch I, I think maybe 
based on what Graham Harrell said, we'll get some more guys uh, to, to rotate in and, and to play against Stanford. Well, this is important. I think you make a really important uh, thing for tonight. You know, coaches say a lot of things, and the players want to believe what coaches tell them. If the players are told, we're going to do a, you're all going to get in, we're going to rotate you all, that's like, okay, I'm fired up. Let's just even take a running back like Steph. He kept waiting to come in. There was even short yardage plays where he didn't come in. And we both saw them working with Steph in goal line and short yardage, and he doesn't get in. Naturally, he's not real happy about that idea. So what happens is they've kind of used their free square in credibility. If he says they're going to rotate guys tonight, they've got to rotate guys tonight because if they don't do it, then, you know, it's all words and the players go, yeah, right. Yeah. Okay. We'll see about that. And then you got problems, especially if it comes after a loss. You know, if a win, they kind of mumble it to each other. After a loss, they all say, well, if he would have put me in there, so, uh, you know, it's, it's a sensitive subject. Yeah, I agree. A, a lot of kind of different dynamics to watch with the offense. But like we mentioned, front and center, that true freshman starting quarterback against a defense like Stanford. So, uh, again, some things that USC has to work with, obviously, the skill players uh, and, and then sort of that improved play from the offensive line. But that I, I think the chess match between USC offense against that Stanford defense is going to absolutely be fascinating to watch here so after this break we'll take a look at the other side of the ball the Stanford offense going against that USC defense all right Eric McKinney back with Daryl Rideau Daryl we're going to look at the USC defense how they match up against the Stanford offense so much talk about USC needing to throw a true freshman out there an injury replacement Stanford now has one of their own uh, an injury replacement going in K.J. Costello getting knocked out of that Northwestern game with a concussion. Davis Mills goes in, finishes out that win. It's a little bit like what we saw from Keaton Slovis finishing out the win. It's not as if, you know, the Stanford offense blew things open. It was kind of ball control, take care of things. Let's just get out of that game with a win. What happens now? USC obviously went against Fresno State with a quarterback with no experience. They're going to get a guy with very limited experience. Uh, in in Davis Mills and Stanford does that help this USC defense does it change anything what what's kind of the mindset for you as a defensive player when you're in this situation well when, whenever we game plan for a team like Stanford and or any other team uh, when I was playing at USC and you, you think about okay if the starter gets knocked out usually the game plan kind of gets tapered down to the skill set of the replacement and in this case Davis Mills coming out of um, the Atlanta, Georgia area as a, as, a, as a JC transfer, we saw a little bit of him against Northwestern. He was 7 of 14, you know, completed 50% of his passes, but you can see the offense really digress. So expect Stanford to come into this game, and I expect USC to, pre to prepare for a, a run game that might um, feature a lot of 21 personnel, two running backs, one tight end sets, may, maybe like an, um, in, uh, uh, an extra offensive lineman on the field. But what 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 uh, Stanford featured early in the game is what I expect to see more of, bunch sets, so that there's a first out, first up, first in from those re the receiving core of a, of a Connor Weddington, a Mike Wilson, and a Kobe Parkinson, getting them together and then kind of fanning them out and see how smart USC is from a communication standpoint. I, I think that what they're going to really try to do is is get balls out in rhythm and try to gain confidence along the way. But if you're David Shaw and you're coming off of a game where you're really not feeling too great about your victory against Northwestern, you're probably going to want to feature a Cameron Scarlett. Cam Scarlett, expect him to be more of a factor coming out of the backfield in terms of catching the ball, but also have more than his 99 net yards uh, rushing of, uh, from last week. 22 carries, expect that probably up a little bit, closer to 30 carries in a game like this. Eric, it's interesting because when you have a backup, you really don't know what to prepare for. So expect USC to, to maybe focus on the things that they did not do well when the pocket collapsed. Because th this kid who's uh, replacing um, Costello is also very mobile at 6'4", and he can extend plays. And his confidence may grow outside of the pocket, as we're seeing more and more quarterbacks do against USC. But the one thing that I do know about a Clancy Pendergast coach team 
is it's very difficult for quarterbacks to find natural pockets. There's so much activity going on. It's almost like looking in the middle of a kaleidoscope. It's just very distracting when you see bodies flashing around you and not lining up where they're maybe lining up, but not hitting the holes that you identify the mic with. So if there is a, an inexperienced offensive line of Stanford, and of course that left tackle a little um, out for this game, expect a lot more pressure to be on Stanford's offensive line to identify the fronts and communications. So I expect to see some maybe um, stunts uh, from the defensive line to try to take advantage of that inexperience. Yeah, we, we mentioned the starting quarterback being out. Like you mentioned, starting left tackle Walker Little, the, the best offensive lineman for Stanford, maybe the best offensive lineman in the entire Pac-12. He's out now probably for about half the season for Stanford. A true freshman coming in. We talk so much Stanford, USC, the trenches. How, you know, how can you get it done? This Stanford offense, it, it doesn't feel like the Stanford offenses of the past where, where they just pound you and pound you and wear you down with the running game. But it, it did seem like there was a step forward compared to last year, certainly, uh, in, in that first game. Does USC have the front seven this year to, to really kind of control that line of scrimmage against Stanford? I think it's by committee. And USC is going to have to feature maybe uh, seven to eight, a rotation of seven to eight, led by Brandon Peely, Marlon uh, Tui Palopu. And, and then also a Connor Murphy could, could play a, a huge role in a game like this because of his big frame. But we started to see a little bit of, of Nick Figueroa um, last week. And Drake Jackson, of course, we have high expectations for him. Um, first true freshman starting there since 2007, so kudos to him. He looks more like a veteran than a, than a freshman. But with Christian Rector, it's going to be very important that they contain the edges and, and, and to allow for a John Houston and um, EA, um, how do I pronounce it? Um, Paula EA, no, I'll tell you, I'll tell you. There you go. You yeah. said it. <laughs> okay. It's going to be very important that they're able to, to kind of hit the, um, hit the holes downhill. That front seven is very capable of holding their own. But the one thing that is going to be crucial is the, the corners and man coverage. Can they hold up? Because there will be times, as we've seen in the past, in this particular uh, matchup against um, Stanford, we saw um, USC take a, sec, a, a defensive back, a corner off the field, and feature two safeties and just one cornerback and, and really try to load up the front and force Stanford into obvious passing situations. That's why I expect a lot more bunch sets. But if USC, from a defensive and athletic standpoint, can hold up against the, the deep coverage passes, I, I think that they will have success. USC's secondary, in particular their safeties, are very athletic, very versatile. And um, Talanao Hufunga and Isaiah Palomao expect them to be factored into the running game. But you just hope that the communication, they don't lose sight of their ability to cover the passing. Because if you can confuse Stanford with your, by holding your disguises and then coming down late where you're not accounted for in the running game, that will protect the corners. But if we see them telegraph things, expect Stanford to maybe roll out their quarterback and just try to, try to hit easy passes. And again, you got Connor Weddington and Mike Wilson, very athletic uh, receivers over 6'2 each, respectively. So in the red zone, they can pose a threat. But, but really, I think Stanford wants to take advantage of the, the matchup at the tight end position. 6'7", Kobe, uh, Kobe Parkinson. He, he is a matchup nightmare at 250, kind of like a Gronkowski of the Pac-12. Um, so I, I do expect Stanford to try to find their opportunities in rhythm. But USC is very talented. And if they can clean up their own mistakes, I think that they should have their way with this Stanford offense as they try to find their new identity moving forward. You know, I think it'll be interesting, Stanford, not a ton of jet sweeps that we've seen or, or really quick things to the outside, but the way it worked for Fresno State against USC, it wouldn't surprise me to see, you know, a Connor Weddington kind of used in that way, just to, just to kind of give USC, you know, some, some eye candy to deal with. They, they know that they got hit with a lot of those plays. So it's got to be, if you, you start seeing that from Stanford, if the team starts using that, you know that's going to come in a little bit. But for me, the, the sort of chess match with both backup quarterbacks being in there, I, I think whoever's defense can sort of 
take the game to the opposing offense, play on the other side of the line of scrimmage and make that quarterback make big, important decisions and get the ball out of his hand uh, it, with quick reads. I, I think that team probably ends up winning the game. And I think, I think USC is capable of that. I don't think we saw absolutely everything out of this USC defense against Fresno State. But for you, what did you see? What, what kind of steps can they make forward? What, where are you looking for, I guess, uh, improvement to come from this USC defense from week one now going right. into week two? Well, the first thing that, that impressed me most was John Houston's ability to move from the wheel linebacker position into the Mike linebacker position and really kind of command the front seven, get everybody lined up, but still be accountable for his own production. And and I was very impressed. 13 tackles coming out of that game, Eric. Uh, that, to me, is the glue. Identifying where, where you want to stunt your line, get in everybody lined up, and protecting in the coverage. Greg Johnson, I didn't have a lot of great confidence in, but I thought, you know, he held his own at the slot position. But the, the area where I had high expectations but felt disappointed has to fall in the secondary. I thought there were times where – just from an alignment and an assignment standpoint, the secondary let the team down by taking poor angles. Um, granted, you know, the same thing that, that makes you laugh also makes you cry, where USC gave up big plays because there was no safety high against post routes. You know, it also came down to a, an heroic play by Isaiah Palomo uh, picking off the ball in the end zone to kind of ice the game. So you know that USC is athletic, and they're very versatile where they can do what they call a seesaw. The safeties can switch positions so that they don't have to scramble all over the field. The corners are, have great size and athleticism. I expect to see more. I expect to see more prideful plays, taking advantage of those 50-50 balls. Uh, I don't think the Stanford's receivers can run away from USC, but I do think that they are great at skilled uh, – they're great skilled receivers that can possess the ball. So. Um, the areas that I'd like to see improvement on are the communications and just simple alignment and assignment. But I would also like to see a little bit more production coming from the edge rushers, whether it's Drake Jackson or Connor Mer uh, um, Christian Rector in this particular game, I think it's going to be critical that they hold their own and they, and they keep the quarterback in the pocket and not allow for him to extend plays. Yeah. We'll see if that USC defense a, can tackle the quarterback a little bit better. That was a talking point coming out of Fresno state can set those edges and can keep doing a good job. I thought they did a good job stopping the run up the middle. Fresno State running back gets 14 carries. His longest carry on the day is seven yards. If Stanford running backs, their longest carry against USC is for seven yards, I think everybody would take that as specifically USC defensive players and the USC defensive coaches. So for the look at the USC defense, how they're going to take how they're going to try to take advantage of this backup quarterback for Stanford. That was Daryl Rodell. Uh, we'll be right back with our look around the Pac-12 and then predictions for USC Stanford. Right, welcome back. We're going to wrap up We Are SC Game Day for USC Stanford. We're going to take a look around the Pac-12. Some interesting games with the Pac-12. Well, you know, one of those conferences that can get out there early and, and play some interesting games. We're going to start number 25, Nebraska, going to Colorado. Daryl, well, what do you think? The Cornhusker is going to see the Buffaloes. I, you know, that, that's one of those old throwback uh, Big 12 matchups. I, I like the Cornhuskers in that game. I'm just not sure that Colorado has enough firepower. All right, Greg? Well, I'm going to have to agree with my uh, esteemed colleague, uh, Mr. Rideau. I think that uh, uh, while Colorado looked better last week uh, with their new coach and played with some fire, Scott Frost has got it going in Nebraska. They're too far ahead, and I'm, I'm picking the Cornhuskers as well. Yeah, I, I'm going to make that three for three. I, you know, I really wish that Colorado could get that win. I, I think that atmosphere is going to be phenomenal uh, at, at Colorado uh, today. And, and I think LaVisco Chanel, I, that guy is unbelievable. I, I could see him having a big day. I just don't know if Colorado has everything uh, that they need yet to get that win over. I think a lot of people have more hope that Nebraska is going to be good than what they've actually shown so far. But I do like Adrian Martinez, and I think Scott Frost is the right guy for the job uh, at Nebraska. 
One of the ones that's interesting for us, San Diego State coming up to the Rose Bowl to take on UCLA. Greg, starting with you, San Diego State at UCLA, who you have there? You know, this is a really unique game. But part of me says that UCLA should be angry, come back. But I know that uh, Bronco Mendenhall, uh, the, the head coach there, is a, is, a, is a stud coach. And uh, – or was it – excuse me, Rocky. The Rocky Long. Rocky, Rocky Long. Long. My, my bad. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to take San Diego State in an upset. I don't know if UCLA is quite uh, recovered from losing at Cincinnati. So, I know Rocky Long's a great defensive coach, and they, they will play smash mouth football. So, it should be interesting. But, no, I'm – I'm taking the Aztecs. All right, Daryl, how about you? Now, while I'd love to think that the Aztecs can come up the 405 freeway into Westwood and pull out or into the, um, the Rose Bowl and pull out a victory, I just think that how embarrassed UCLA was under Chip Kelly last week, I, I think that they right the ship this week and they get their first victory in particular at home. So I, I got UCLA, but in a close one, like a 23-20 type of just – um, you know, a snot drag out football game that, that comes down to a field goal. You know, I, I'm not going to pick UCLA and I don't feel like I have to explain why. <laughs> uh, I, I do think right now, if you look at the programs, you know, San Diego State seems like they're running better as a program. I, I think you wanted to see a whole lot more from UCLA against Cincinnati. Early on, it looked interesting. It looked like, hey, the, you know, this offense has – some tweaks to it. Maybe this is the Chip Kelly offense, and then it just never quite got into second gear. And really a lot of missed throws from Dorian Thompson Robinson. I think uh, if you know UCLA fans were expecting that next step, they didn't get it in game one. It's going to have to happen against San Diego State. But I like like Greg, I think San Diego State can come up uh, and get that get that. Maybe it's an upset. Maybe you know, maybe not. Again, we talked about kind of where the programs are right now. Uh, one game that, that would be an upset, Nevada goes up to Oregon. Nevada, probably, you know, the, the game of the week last week with that late huge field goal to beat Purdue. Oregon, maybe the biggest gut punch uh, of the entire first week, losing that nationally televised game to Auburn on a touchdown with, I think, nine seconds left uh, in a game that, that they really should have won. I certainly expect the Ducks to bounce back. They, they looked good for a lot of that game. And I don't think sort of the end is indicative of, of who they are. I, I think they have a chance to rebound and, and put up a big win and kind of get back off to the season that, that people expected for them. Daryl. Yeah. I, I still think that um, crystal ball has something going over there and in Oregon, and re regardless of the fact that they lost a heartbreaker at the end of the game against an Auburn team that it could have won either way. They're still the darling of the Pac-12 uh, between them and Washington. It's still to be determined what USC team is going to show up. But I, just, I have a hard time believing that a Nevada team can go up into Eugene as loud as that stadium and as ruckus as that stadium is going to be uh, the, you know, today and pull out a victory. Um, I expect Oregon to roll and just and roll big in this game. Greg? Quack, quack, quack. It's going to be a steamroller job. Uh, Nevada is at the wrong place at the wrong time. And Oregon's going to say, if we got, we have to come back. I can't imagine Oregon going down 0-2, especially in Austin. So the wings will be flying. All right, so USC-Stanford, not the only Pac-12 game this early in the season. Cal goes up to Washington and We've seen a lot from this Cal defense. It, it happened in a hurry that it has become one of the best units, offense or defense, uh, in the Pac-12. It, it's it's no longer sort of, you know, the the Cal offense and let's see what happens with the defense. That that defense really leads the charge for Cal. They go up to Washington, who again Washington not tested in, in their first game against Eastern Washington, but. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll see. Washington again is that team now, especially because Oregon. Seems like every year some Pac-12 team takes a national loss. This was Oregon's year to do it uh, so early in the season. Um, Washington now, you know, maybe that team that's out front for the Pac-12. Greg, do they get it done uh, against Cal? Washington will win. Washington can score more points uh, than Cal. 
I think Cal will come to play. Game is not being played in Berkeley. It's being played in Husky Stadium. Makes a big difference. Uh, I think it could be close at the beginning, depending on turnovers. But I think that Washington will pull away. All right. Daryl, how about you? You with Washington? Nah, don't sleep on Justin Wilcox. Um, I'm, I'm glad he's not USC's defensive coordinator. But, but I tell you what. Uh, they do run their own version of an air raid offense, so they're very capable of putting up points, especially if they can build some momentum. But that defense is, is, is really stout uh, for, for the Cal Bears. And until I see otherwise, I think that Washington Huskies has a glass chin. I felt that way for a number of years now since USC went into that stadium and, and punched them in the mouth with great tight end play and, and a vaunted running attack. So I expect – this could potentially be an upset. And um, so I'm going with Cal for the upset. Why not? All right. I, I don't have as much faith in Cal. I know it's kind of early in the season, so it's easy to go with the favorites. But I think Washington is a good team. And I think that good teams can beat Cal this year. I think if you have it together offensively, uh, you can score enough points against that defense. But, Daryl, I'm, I'm interested to watch Eric, that game now that you give One that more thing. Look. When it comes to UCLA and Cal, they're on a trimester. So these kids are not in school right now. They're pretty much living in a dorm, 100% focused on football. Anything can happen. But come week four or five, that's when they start to slide. All right. All right. So, Greg, starting with you, the game, really, really the only game that matters. USC Stanford at the Coliseum, 730 kickoff, number 23 Stanford, unranked USC. Let's hear your prediction tonight. Okay, well, I'm from the 1960s, so you got to tell it like it is. In the preseason, I picked Stanford to win, okay? So I don't back down from that. However, some of the elements have changed. So I'm going to put it this way to you. If K.J. Costello plays, Stanford will win. If K.J. Costello doesn't win, uh, Chase McGrath is going to make the difference, uh, and he's going to kick some field goals. But also consider the Jets owner from Stanford is a good place to kicker. But I think SC can – Pull it out if K.J. Costello isn't quarterback in Stanford. All right, interesting. Daryl, how about you? Who do you have tonight? If there's any team that Clay Helton is not intimidated by, it's David Shaw, Stanford Cardinal. I, I think that between him and Clancy Pendergast, they always seem to devise a great scheme. Then it comes down to quarterback play. Can they get enough out of Keaton Slovis uh, to extend drives? Keaton must protect himself, throw in rhythm, and stay away from Pulse and Adobe. If he does that and they take care of Swan on the defensive line, I think that they'll be okay. USC is just too potent, too much firepower, and there's not enough Pulse, uh, Pulse and Adobes out there to cover the vaunted um, receiving core of USC. I like USC big, 35-17, simply because I just think that this kid, uh, Slovis, has a little bit of moxie to him. And he's not going to let the moment get too big for him. You know, I think USC wins too. You cannot have four turnovers like they had against Fresno State because Stanford will take advantage of those in a way that Fresno State could not. But I, like you said, I, I think there's something with Keaton Slovis taking over here. And it was obvious the way the coaches talked about him all the way back in spring. They really like his ability. I don't know if anybody, coaches included, maybe Keaton Slovis included, wanted him to be playing this early in his career. But I think there is something, and I don't think that this is the Stanford team, uh, a little bit like when USC started the slide, where when they would go in somewhere, nobody was thinking, oh, no, here come the Trojans. Right. Yep. I think Stanford has hit that point. I, I don't think it's, oh, no, here comes Stanford. I, I think teams get excited to play Stanford now. And, and I do think that USC wants to correct a lot of the mistakes that they had against Fresno State, I think that they can come out and win. I'm not going to go Daryl Rideau here and call a blowout uh, by any means, but, but I do think USC ha has a great shot to come away with the win tonight, which would make a 2-0 start and, and really kind of a, with all the sort of issues that you've had and losing your starting quarterback, 2-0 would be as good of a start as you could possibly get through two games. So I, I think tonight we've talked about it a lot. During the preseason, we've talked a lot about during fall camp and, and even since the season has started, this is your game that sort of sets your paths, I think, for the season. If you come away with a win at Stanford, you are flying high going to BYU. 
if Stanford comes away with the win out of the Coliseum, I, I think it pops that balloon maybe big time because now you've got a team that has to figure out how to rebound, and that is not something that they could figure out last year. So, again, all eyes on the Los Angeles Memorial Coliseum tonight as USC hosts number 23, Stanford Cardinal. For Dale Rideau, for Greg Katz, this is Eric McKinney. Thanks for watching. We are SC Game Day.